Hello everybody, Gunstock Michael here with a couple of gun updates. Uh, first, this is an air gun, a Diana model 75, I think it is, 74. Action's in the safe. Um, kind of a rare, older target gun. The stock has some damage that we're going to repair, and the finish was horrible on it. I mean, just doing this repair was going to require it to be refinished anyway, but uh, it was full of dents and dings and deep scratches, and the finish is almost like paint. I mean, it's not paint, but it's so thick. I don't know if you can see here on the adjustable cheek piece, just this drips of just thick finish, and I uh, experienced that all over on the stock. and. And the finish is so thick and old, you can't see, I mean, maybe the camera and the reflecting light might pick it up better than the naked eye does, but can barely see, I suppose, um, the color and figure of the grain. Although, once I got it sanded down, it doesn't like there's a whole lot of either one of those anyway terms of color or figure. It looks like it's just plain, straight grain wood and very light colored. Looks like walnut, sounds like walnut, has the grain structure walnut, I'm guessing it's walnut, it's just a really light, um, but it might be some other wood, I, I don't know, most of my experiences with walnut and, and beech by default, because a lot of our inexpensive guns come with beech stocks, um, well in any case, that's what I ended up with, is pretty light color, there's still uh, quite a bit more sanding to do. I have to do this yet, <clears throat> and a little section here uh, wrapping around to the trigger guard. I'm trying not to impact the sandblasted, uh, stippled, not really stippling, it looks to me to be have been sandblasted. I'm trying to avoid these areas and just to uh, add a whole lot more work and uh, effort and maybe risk to the project if the results don't look good. Uh, I'm just trying to take care of the beat up parts of the wood that were finished and uh, and repair the broken wood parts. Now how this is going to oil back up is a mystery. I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm pretty sure we're going to end up with a result that's going to look awesome but it's not going to look necessarily like all other factory examples of this gun because I think the finish they used, it looks like it's an oil finish, it kind of sands that way, just really thick, and I believe they had a pigment added to it uh, to make it like a stain and a finish rolled in run one. Uh, the, the stain is not so deep into the wood that it makes me think that they did either ammonia fuming, like they do on beach, or... <clears throat> or a stain that was applied to the wood before the finish. I think it was just a very thick consistency of a finish with the pigment added so that it worked as a stain and a finish at once and thick enough that it largely filled the grain on probably one pass, despite the fact that it left a pretty goopy appearance after it cured and hid the wood. <clears throat> So I'm not sure what exactly my plan is going to be yet. Um, probably going to test just plain uh, finish on uh, some area that won't matter. It'll be easier to sand off again, maybe uh, here. Um, I really don't want to use stain. I don't like using stain because as we go through the finishing process, we uh, apply half a dozen coats of finish and then we sand it back down to the level of the wood and then apply oil and sand it back down again. And as we go, we find imperfections in the wood. We find sanding scratches from previous sandings that we didn't see before, but as the finish improves, they start to pop and then we got to sand down and take care of those. And you can't do that with a stained finish. Once we stain the wood and start putting oil on top of it, that, that's all we got. There's not going to be any sanding go on or it's going to make it look horrible. So I really want to avoid using stain. <clears throat> uh, not using stain means that we have easy repairability in the future. Any dings or scratches are easily steamed out and hit with a couple wipes of oil and it's done. But when it's stained, you can't do that. You go try to sand out a little spot and you're just going to sand through the stain and leave a blotchy look. So, Anyway, I think you understand. I'm rambling. One thing that I did want to share with you all, and I think I have before, 
is steaming out dents. This stock had some really significant dents and well unfortunately I didn't film them and now they're so gone I can't even point them out to you anymore but there were some that were pretty big and I uh, just used, I already put it away uh, a bit, uh, oh here it's not too far away some random scrap of metal, this is aluminum, it could be steel or whatever uh, and heat it up in a propane tor torch and a little bit of uh, damp paper towel and just pssst, just drive that steam into the dent and some of these dents took like a dozen applications maybe of heating it up and steaming it and heating it up and steaming it but it's actually an amazing technique and the, st and the dents largely come out and in this case they pretty much all raised to the level of the wood. I was able to get all the dents, even really significant ones, to raise up to the level of the wood. The advantage of that is you got a big old dent or scratch and you want to sand down the entire surface to get to the bottom of the dent. That could be a lot of wood removal. And then you're talking about changing the shape of the thing and the, and the labor involved in doing that when it's so easy to steam it out so the dent is back up to the level of the wood, sand it a little bit to make it fair and Hit it with oil if it's an already finished stock. So okay, that's it. I'm, I got several more hours of sanding. I have to do this yet. And there's also a butt pad out of wood that needs to be done. And so yeah, I've, I've got quite a lot of sanding yet to do. And I'm still at 120 grit, haven't even got to find grit. So I, I got a lot of sanding ahead of me on this project, but I think it's going to come out good. Oh, and then I want to tell you that after sanding, uh, before, you know, in fact, as I'm talking about this, I probably should do this before I go too much further in the sanding, is I want to bed the action to the inletting of the stock, and while I'm at it, I'm going to bed up this missing piece of wood with just bedding compound. Well, that was my initial plan. If I could find a light colored piece of wood around here, you know, maybe I could try to fashion a replacement piece of wood. Well, <clears throat> certainly a uh, bedding compound is super easy, but with this being such a light colored wood, well anyway, you'll see what I end up with. I'm still kicking it around and uh, I will report back on the plan. Now uh, I want to put the move the camera. I guess I won't put it on pause. I'm just going to carry you over around the corner to this other workstation here. <clears throat> to this gun. Let me push the camera back a little bit. Sorry, it's dizzying. I am not a pro videographer. Don't claim to be. If I was, I have a million dollar channel. So this, uh, this is such a uh, close focus lens. You think you can see the whole thing. It's a Mannlicher stocked, uh, muzzle loading. My, I think this was a percussion cap muzzle loader. Don't know a lot about these guns, but this is an interesting project. It uh, came in with a broken stock and it snapped off right at the wrist. And let's see, move this in close. You could see, oh, hold this right side up here. I'm upside down. You can see how skinny that wrist was. Oh, I should have waited. This barrel, it's solid. It's got to be 10 pounds just in this barrel. Look at the size of that steel. And the interesting bore. Oh, let me get that in the camera there. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Here's the other end. Nowhere to put a bullet. Oh, let me rotate this around. Now, I am not tasked with turning this into a shooter, and that's a good thing because it's got a bunch of issues. Uh, I think the intent is to hang it on the wall in a shadow box and commemorate Grandpa's gun. <clears throat> Did notice a couple issues as I was taking it apart, besides the incredible issues with the wood, but um, there's these little tabs underneath the air let me hold it up close to the camera these little tabs here engage pins in the stock but this one is snapped off doesn't really matter and the pin that should have gone through the stock is missing 
it is interesting with these old guns and by the way this this part of the stock this is light as a feather it has like virtually no weight at all it's so slender so thin it's amazing they were able to work a piece of wood this long and that thin um, and you can see the handwork that was involved in it what well, one uh, interesting uh, thing to note about this stock is what appears to be figure here in the wood see the rippled wood look that we call figure but it's actually a plain plain piece of some kind of white wood it might be walnut I don't know it's it's pretty white might be sycamore I don't know but what they did oh here you can see some of this fake figure here looks pretty good but how they did it is they soaked string in tar and wrapped the wood with it and they might use different thicknesses of string in different areas and maybe vary the spacing of the string as they wrapped it and then they burned it and uh, burned this uh, this pattern into the wood I understand uh, sometimes uh, guys uh, would uh, if they didn't have this already done on their stock would do it to provide a little beauty to their stock and then these these little things here now I'd be very curious to hear from any of you that see this video please uh, comment down below because I really don't know anything about this um, but my lifelong 81 year old gun stock making father tells me that they put these on uh, guns as good luck charms so that as the bullet traveled down the barrel it would be picking up luck as it passed over these little good luck charms embedded in the wood and uh, that's really an amazing story and please let me know if that's true or what you know about that but look at the the detailed work to inlay these things into the stock yeah, it's pretty cool so anyway uh, curiosity aside I'm tasked with putting this back together again and I got very little wood to work with and this barrel weighing as much as it does that's an incredible amount of force to put on this little piece of wood I could almost see trying to hold the gun like this a cantilever and, and just having the weight of the barrel just snap this off because it just doesn't seem strong enough and in fact I see many many other uh, breaks and repairs there are areas that are filled there's little broken pieces of wood that have been glued back in and there's this here this piece of wood that's sticking out if you look here I, I hope YouTube doesn't dumb down the video so much you can't see this detail but this this piece of wood was inlaid into the stock and I don't know it might have been done from the factory uh, to stiffen this weak area just by <laughs> but look how thin this piece of wood was I, I don't know what kind of real reinforcement that could have provided but uh, so I don't know if these were uh, brake repairs or if this was from the factory but um, the other one here look at the other side you can see where uh, this sticking up piece fits right in there and then this side this this reinforcing piece, I don't know if you can make out, it, it's inlaid just like the other side, but it broke off, so it's, it's still completely embedded in its um, wood. So my plan is to machine a piece of aluminum bar, and I'm thinking I might, I might start with this piece, uh, but I'm going to have to machine it down and get it where I want it, because there's a pin that goes through here. So I can't have this uh, piece of metal that's going to go down inside be any wider than the pin. And then there's a screw here. So there's a lot of little challenges to get a, uh, a metal brace to fit down between the uh, obstructions. And then it's going to be challenging. I'm going to have to do it by hand with a burr on a rotary tool and uh, open up a square channel in both ends of the wood to get this in there. And then we'll epoxy it in. Uh, bed to the difference you know in any torn wood and it uh, will it should I hope never break again uh, especially since it's going to be in a shadow box right 
Okay, so those that's an update on these two projects I'm working on. Super excited to get them done because I know there are people out there that are looking forward to their guns, getting them back. But as soon as I do get them done, I'm very excited to get started on building a two-seat bass fishing pontoon boat for uh, the lake. I, I mainly fly fish for trout, but I ended up living on the side of a bass lake, so when in Rome, right? So I uh, can't afford uh, anything uh, commercial that would do what I want to do, so i got a plan to build it. And there's a segment of the bass fishing community, um, they've got their own competitions of fishing with kayaks. They have rules of those kayaks. They're heavy, they're rotomolded plastic. Nobody's making a hollow molded carbon fiber, lightweight, super efficient, high speed fishing craft for these competitions. So I think it's a product opportunity, but mainly I want one for me not to do competitions in. Uh, it's going to be 17 feet long, it'll be a two-seater and it'll be uh, reconfigurable to a single seat uh, in case it ever is a product and people use it in bass fishing competitions. It'll be a pontoon boat. Each pontoon will be approximately 12 inches uh, cross-section and 17 feet long and then a platform uh, spanning them. The pontoons will be hollow molded carbon fiber, fiberglass, a Kevlar bottom, uh, foam core, It'd be super lightweight. Uh, I had a racing canoe once. I could put the thing on top of the car with one hand. Uh, I don't remember the length. It might have been about 14 feet long. It weighed 32 pounds. Uh, the fishing kayaks are the best. There's one product on the market that's similar to what I'm talking about. Uh, Blue Sky Angler 360. I think most of their value is in their super fancy fishing seat that swivels around and goes up and down and tilts and probably gives you a massage while you're fishing. Uh, I'm not planning on doing anything like that, but their boat is a, uh, a two pontoon fishing craft and it's super heavy. It's hollow molded, I mean roto molded plastic. Uh, and it is cool, but you got to trailer it. And what I'm looking to do is build something that's be a canoe replacer. Uh, my fishing craft for a long time now has been a canoe, it goes on top of the van, but it covers the solar panels. So with the pontoon boat, I'm hoping I can put a pontoon on either side of the roof rack and leave the solar panels relatively unobstructed to the sky. So I'm excited about that. Got lots of house projects going on. I got web work, which is what pays my bills. I'm really grateful for you all, though, that send me, not you all, they're the you few who send me uh, gunstock work or gunstock repair work. Really grateful for that. Really do enjoy doing that. Wish I could make a living at it. And I'm sorry, you who are waiting for my uh, for your projects to be completed that uh, got slow here in the last couple of months. I had to finish my van build and go fishing in the fall before that finished up. And, and there was the holiday, but I'm here in the shop and I'm working diligently now on your projects. And I'll check back in by video in a couple of days and really happy to be posting again. Thanks everybody for checking in on me. Please like, share, subscribe, and uh, see you in a couple of days.